Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for being here today. We know how valuable your time is, and we have a great guest speaker today talking about get the most college for the least cost. I'm Rita Wolfson. I am the founder of Financial Social Work. Uh, we do this free monthly webinar on the second Thursday of every month. And we'll tell you which ones are coming up when we finish here today. Our guest speaker is Marcio Silvera, and he will be telling you about himself in a few moments. And I think you're really in for a treat because you will know things that probably most other people don't know. First, Let's go over some commonly asked questions and a few suggestions I have for everyone. You can check the, check the chat box for any messages that are there. The slides aren't shared, they are proprietary. The recording, the recording will be on our website, Facebook page and YouTube channel within a day or so. Uh, any questions you have throughout the presentation, go ahead and type them into the question box and we will answer as many as time permits. Please keep them general. Our speaker will not be taking specific cases to reply to. Um, there are no CEs or certificates of attendance for this webinar. Um, and the link, should you have any technical issues, is in the chat box for how to take care of that. I do start our monthly free webinars with our financial social work affirmation, which I think captures what we are all about. Just for today, I will love myself enough to face my fears, practice self-acceptance, and embrace hope. I will silence my inner critic, speak my truth, and make peace with myself and with my past. Just for today, I will give myself permission to eliminate toxic people, beliefs, and behaviors from my life. And just for today, I will prepare for a better tomorrow by healing my relationship with my money and with myself. Let's start off with a poll. I know Marcio has some for you. We like this to be as interactive as possible. So I have one poll for you and I am going to go ahead and launch it. It's not directly uh, or specifically related with this presentation, but it's something that I've been thinking a lot about and wanted to know how you, our audience, feel about inflation. So we will give you a few more seconds. A little over 60% of you have voted. I always tell our guest speakers what a great audience we have, that everybody is so interactive and participates. So over 70% of you have voted. If you want to vote, I'm going to, well, it seems to have closed itself. So I will go ahead and share the results with you. And I can see that a good percentage. Oh, what? This is totally getting away from me today. A good percentage of you are concerned. I'm certainly concerned and I would guess that you're concerned when you're in the supermarket or trying to make plans to make purchases uh, that you need. So we'll go ahead and close that poll and get started on my part of this. So we know that no one chooses to have money problems, but most people do. And one or more of the reasons is that money is always the elephant in the room. And money and financial health and wellness is about so much more than dollars, cents, jet, math, budgets, 
and crisis intervention, which is where financial social work comes in. We are about and at the intersection of social work, politics, the economy, gender, economic, and social justice, and all we address all financial inequity from racism to mental health access barriers, healthcare costs, and everything in between. At the core of this work, it's about our relationship with money and our relationship with ourselves. We explore the fundamentals of financial health, the thoughts, feelings, attitudes, beliefs, experiences, and values that each person has. That is the psychosocial component. And from that stems how we address financial behavior, how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. It is a behavior model because until and unless behavior changes, nothing changes. And we use a trans theoretical model moving from pre-contemplation all the way around to maintenance. It's interactive, reflective, and strength-based, educational, motivational, and supportive, holistic, multidisciplinary, and healing. Hopeful, helpful, and financial social work changes lives of individuals as well as groups of people. The process looks at healing our relationship with money, recognizing and taking ownership of our own financial health, and healing our relationship with self through self-discovery, self-care, and self-healing. That is the process. Because budgeting, banking, saving, and other traditional money management basics cannot and will not meet clients' needs before anyone can cope with the dollar cents, budgets, and crises of financial problems and stress and trauma, they must heal their relationship with their money and with themselves. Because when you have an unhealthy relationship with money and self, you will always be more vulnerable, certainly to financial trauma, which prevents anyone experiencing it from learning new money management skills, tools, or information. So we've just kind of moved through the core concepts of my work in financial social work. Financial health and wellness are essential components of physical, mental, emotional, and social well-being. It is a universal truth, which unfortunately is not universally understood. So crisis intervention as a principal method for helping clients with financial issues perpetuates the belief the financial problems are unavoidable and unpredictable. And yes, there are certain problems that are unavoidable and unpredictable, but the majority of problems aren't unavoidable or unpredictable, which is why we want to help move clients beyond the dollar, cents, debt, and budgets of more traditional uh, financial literacy, financial education work. The primary predictor of financial health and wellness is an individual's relationship with his money and himself. And now it gives me real pleasure to turn this over to Marcio Silvera, who will introduce himself. And you can see he's, we're really lucky to have him here. And he will be the one to continue with our webinar. Marcio, are you good? 
Hello, Rita. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you. Can you see my screen now, uh, Rita? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you very much for taking time from your busy schedules to attend this webinar today. This topic is very dear to me because this is a really hard topic, how to deal with the challenge of paying for college and how to be as efficient and as uh, informed as you can in this very tricky process. So let's get started. This is who I am. I am a financial advisor. I have uh, the CFA designation and the CFP Charter Financial Analyst and Certified Financial Planner. And I'm an advisor in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. Many of our clients have kids going through college or they're about to go to college. And uh, this is very personal to me as well because I have my own kids that will uh, deal with the challenge of uh, going through college and paying for college. They're a bit young now, but uh, I know this is gonna happen very soon and this is gonna deal with my own family. So this topic is, is actually very personal. Well, I wanna highlight the need that college is very important and uh, it's more and more important today in our economy in the 21st century. The economy is more complex and being able to have critical thinking skills, being able to have general knowledge, being able to tackle some novel problems, is a skill very much valued by several employers these days. And uh, that skill also uh, creates a, a demand for uh, higher pay if you are in uh, a position of having been able to acquire college education. Uh, this is something that is happening now and it's getting to be more and more of, uh, of, of a concern for several families. And it happens at all levels, the highest levels and the lowest levels. It's become so much of a concern that um, these days, some families actually want to cut corners to make sure that their kids attend their, uh, their, their favorite colleges. And uh, if you remember in 2019, there was a college of bribing scandal and uh, the, some admissions to uh, the most prestigious uh, schools, they were kind of rigged by this little, by this racket that parents there get, get super concerned about getting their kids in and they want to do everything it takes, even if, you know, you have to cheat the system. And uh, so you can see how, how crazy the whole thing has gotten. And I, we have a poll uh, question for you guys uh, and uh, related to our, uh, the, fir the first uh, estimate here is, is about this college um, uh, bribing scandal that happened in 2019. And here it is, and I'm gonna share this poll with, uh, with you now. So we have a poll open, and uh, the poll is uh, about the the bribe that uh, the sailing coach of Stanford, Stanford University uh, received to let kids in to uh, he, what he admitted in court of having received for letting uh, some students in, pretending they are part of the sailing team and not really that being the case, but. Uh, all right, we're close to getting the votes in. Have a, what's your best estimate? Uh, this shows how families are concerned. There's people, that donate to colleges if, if you're super wealthy you can do it but some others they want to do use the back door and uh, actually cheat the system so yeah uh any more votes in i think uh uh 
we we very close come on a, a few extra and um, what is winning is the last option two hundred and seventy thousand and that is correct two hundred and seventy thousand this is the amount that the uh, uh, coach of the sailing team of Stanford University uh, admitted having accepted for letting some students in. So um, this is great. And uh, uh, now uh, showing the poll results, 44% for 270 in and 41% uh, the, the other value that gets close to it. Um, so this this shows how much families they they care about getting their kids to college. Now um, back to the presentation, uh, the cost of tuition over the years has gone up so much. The, the inflation rate has we just were talking about inflation a little bit earlier has been averaging about. 2% per year. The college inflation uh, for the same period was 5%. But that number is the sticker price, that the listed price that shows that uh, what uh, you pay for college and, uh, and uh, if you don't have any breaks at all. That's what's there. That's the sticker price. But the reality is not everybody pays the sticker price. Only a minority of people pay the sticker price. But still, we have an issue of uh, the fact that this challenge of college has been less and less affordable. You have a huge amount of student loan debt. It's over $1.7 trillion with a T and over 40 million borrowers. So this is a widespread situation. And a lot has to do with being able to deal with uh, this uh, matter of uh, all these fears uh, that, okay, what can happen if uh, I don't go to college? And uh, I would like to open for another question of the amount of, of the sticker price uh, that you, you may have uh, of uh, uh, that uh, can, can be the cost of going to college. What is that price, the listed price? Uh, <laughs> it is, uh, what amount do you, you believe it's a, it's a sticker price for New York University? Oh, that's, that's close, huh? <laughs> Okay, that's good. We have 70% of people voted, so let's go ahead and show that. So let's show the results. What is the best estimate? What? The result is um, the uh, answer is $300,000 of the sticker price of New York University, 75 thousand uh, dollars a year to pay for the sticker price there so that's that's a house it's a it's a lot of money the sticker price uh, now when you're making these college uh, decisions then uh, what you have is uh, the situation of all these emotions going in at the same time and uh, the emotions can be quite challenging uh, to process because it's a difficult situation in terms of, uh, of understanding the facts and, uh, and, and navigating the complexities, but then there's so much emotional charge. The very first one is the emotion of fear. I would never get in today. What if the children don't att attend uh, the top college? And uh, I, I'm going to be like having my next generation falling down the, the, the social ladder because they didn't get enough of the adequate education. Uh, this is this concern is a very uh, big one, and it really clouds the view and makes people 
make decisions there may not be the the most uh, uh measure most rational ones another big emotion in the process is the emotion of guilt. some parents they feel it's their duty to pay for everything and uh, if they cannot afford this it is on them they feel like a failure and this is really strong in our society these days that uh, if you need to do everything for our children so uh feel so guilty that uh, you know you're not you cannot get like the best possible edu education because of uh, some financial constraints. So guilt is a very strong emotion in the process. Finally, snobbery and elit el el elitism. Uh, that means it's sending your kids to certain uh, colleges can be seen as, as a luxury consumption item. Again, not super helpful because uh, uh, this is, not about uh, uh, fancy conspicuous consumption. It is about uh, providing uh, with your family with uh, with the tools to succeed in this world and and making them uh, more uh, engaged, productive citizens. But a lot of it has to do with the parents themselves feeling that uh, they want to show off the fact that they can send the kids somewhere, um, and uh, this all gets mixed up into a very challenging situation that uh, how are you going to deal with all that? How are you going to deal with all these different uh, uh, aspects? What makes it super challenging is the fact that uh, uh, colleges themselves are competing. There's this U.S. News and World Report ranking of the best colleges, and that creates very interesting dynamics. Uh, very interesting uh, situation. And uh, this has, the, uh, I, I want to uh, open another poll here about when it was the, the first time this ranking of US News and World Report actually was published. And this is a, many people are aware of those, uh, of this link, uh, of, of this uh, link between the uh, uh, U.S. News and World Report and uh, and and the, the famous college their college rankings. And the the answers are coming in. Getting close to seventy percent. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, let's wait a few more answers. Let's, let's check the the result now. <laughs> and the answer you guys were right in the estimate is 1983 when the uh u.s news and world report best college ranking came and became the uh the, the this this major driver of college tuition the tuition inflation that five percent figure that we we had seen in the past and that five percent figure has to do with the, this uh disconnect between the college tuition and the actual price uh, that uh, uh, the students pay. Here is uh, the reality. Have you ever been to a grocery store and you saw this wine and discount and you feel like there's a hundred dollar wine that's going for forty dollars and that you feel like you got a great deal? Well, Colleges, they play the same game. They say they play the game of listing a price that is very, very high and uh, then providing discounts and making families and students feel they, get, they got a great deal. So they play with those emotions. They play with the emotions of, of fear, of guilt and snobbery. And it, in a way, uh, the consumption of college education has become a little bit like consumption of a luxury wine. And, uh, and, and having the discount is, is what colleges have to do to attract students. 
and to attract students that can help them rank better in the, the ranking of uh, the U.S. News and World Report uh, ranking. So uh, the, the fact that you bring in certain students, the desirable students, this, the colleges start to differentiate and they provide all sorts of assistance. They provide merit aid, they provide need-based aid, they start differentiating and it ends up that 89% of the students don't pay the full sticker price. Uh, most students get some type of discount and most people are not fully aware of it. Uh, it's The reality is that uh, what we see, the $300,000 sticker price for New York University, a small number of students actually pay that cost. But navigating the process is quite uh, of, a, of a tricky uh, challenge. And uh, you have here these uh, parents investing a lot in education. And it really helps to, for them to do their homework and uh, in creating the, uh, the, 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 the right uh, approach to the college funding challenge. Now, uh, to last for college, education is, uh, preparation is essential, and the earlier, the better. To understand the magnitude of how much you can pay last for college, uh, I would like to uh, have another poll for you guys to have like an estimate of the actual price, the actual annual cost that families pay for college. What will be your estimate of the actual cost? Not the list of the sticker price, but the actual cost. What's your best number here? The question, the answers are coming in. Yep, there's this difference between the actual versus the sticker price that families pay. All right, I like that one. <laughs> All right, let's share the results on this one. Well, here it is. The actual cost from private colleges that students pay is $25,000. They are very close to $25,000. It's including room and board. It's everything. Tuition plus room and board, $25,000 per year. And you see the, the, the value of doing that preparation, of being ready and knowing to navigate this process, how much you can save. Basically, the gap is, okay, the, on the high end, you have 75, and the average is 25. So it's an enormous difference. Uh, and uh, the reality is colleges, they do differentiate a lot between students. Many, many factors. And imagine your classroom just like an airplane cabin. When you fly, you pay a different price depending on when you book your ticket, where you are on the plane, and uh, many factors. And they have so, uh, com uh, complex, sophisticated software to do the price differentiation when you're flying somewhere. <laughs> the colleges, they are doing the same thing. They have expensive consultants. They have uh, uh, all these algorithms to uh, price their educational services the same way an airline prices their air transportation services. It is a bit insane that uh, it, this is what's going on. But uh, uh, how you can, you can deal with, with the decision that it's very complex, you don't know where you're going to land, and it's full of emotion, so cognitively it's, it's, it's complex, and then also emotionally it's complex, and then you have uh, the schools themselves, they're playing their game because they want to rank high in, uh, in, in their competition, in their uh, the, uh, US News and World Report ranking. So, uh, first of all, be aware of your cognitive biases. Two big biases there, the status quo bias, and then overconfidence. Legacy, meaning uh, whatever happened before is now what's going on, things are changing. And then everybody's doing it 
or the high cost must be justified because it's there, it's listed there. Not necessarily. Let's challenge the status quo bias. And let's challenge also the overconfidence bias. It's a very common bias, but uh, it feels like you commit more than what you can. And uh, also, contracting large debts could be a good idea. Like things will be all right in the end. You gotta challenge a bit that impulse because sometimes uh, if you're more cautious, it can go a long way for a better decision. But once you overcome these biases, I like to list five ways to pay less for college. Uh, and let's get started. You have the choosing a local college, joining the military, attending a university abroad, hunt for merit uh, grants and scholarships, and then be savvy about uh, the FAFSA and the CSS profile. Let's start with the local college. We're located right here in Maryland. We have uh, neighbors of University of Maryland, so I like to list this one. It's our favorite school. And uh, when you go to a local school and you pay in-state tuition, and if sometimes you commute and you live with your parents, a lot of money can be saved. So be aware that this is an option. Sometimes it can be a fine option, and you can have a fine education. And uh, this can go a long way to pave the way for last debt, more financial independence and be ready to tackle the future. So this is tip number one, local state college. Number two, joining the military. Uh, there are three ways to do that. And the very first one is uh, to enlist and benefit from the enlisted uh, service members, educational benefits, the, uh, the GI Bill and some other uh, educational benefits from being part of the military. Uh, the second option is you join a college that has the ROTC program, is the Reserve Officers Training Corps program, and it can be a great way to obtain your education, you obtain your military leadership education, it can be a good way to learn how to be a leader, and you'll be uh, a commission officer once you graduate from college. It can be a great opportunity to pay a whole lot less and they are great scholarships if you're part of the ROTC program. And finally, it's quite challenging to get in, but if you can, the service academies, you have top-notch education, a guaranteed job in the end of the process, you serve the country, serve the military, and uh, you don't pay anything. You actually get a little small pay while you are uh, going through the process of uh, attending a service academy. And that can be the Naval Academy right here, our neighbors in uh, uh, Annapolis, Maryland, uh, but also the uh, West Point and uh, the uh, the Air Force Academy, the, uh, uh, the Coast Guard. So you have all these, the service academies are a great option as well to pay less for college. So don't uh, uh, dismiss this because you may be able to get in and they can have great education for very, very little money, and actually you make money while you attend. Another option many people are not aware of, but you can have a fine education outside of the United States. Uh, a lot of schools in Europe, they teach their programs in English, and it's not so uh, hard to get in. Uh, it's as long as you're informed about the process and go through the steps. I myself was an exchange student in France. I had a nice experience there. Many of my courses there were courses done in English. And um, I, I really liked the opportunity. And you'll have a chance to be uh, there in a foreign country, learn a foreign language, learn about a foreign culture. It's a very much valued skill in this global world. And uh, guess what? There are many, I, I'm listing these two countries here, Germany and France. There are many, many German and French companies in the United States and uh, employment to this company. If you have gone to school there, you definitely have an edge. So um, here is a tip and it can cost a whole lot less than a US school. So the uh, experience of going to uh, school abroad can be a great way to engage with a high, uh, high education, gain valuable skills and pay less. Uh, now, there's this uh, a, a opportunity for grants and scholarships. Many, many nonprofits offer very specific grants, very specific scholarships. 
anybody from any background can uh, qualify. There are many, many opportunities based on several different criteria. So I really encourage uh, students to do some, uh, some research on this. Uh, I have served in the Arlington Community Foundation a College Grant Committee several years, and we awarded scholarships to several students in our local community in Arlington, Virginia. So uh, we have uh, a way to uh, help people pay for college, and this is very available all over the place. People just need to do their homework and make sure the applications are submitted on time, and uh, you find your recommendation letters and everything being organized, be prepared. But when you're organized and prepared, this can be a great way to save uh, money for college, uh, applying for uh, grants and scholarships. Now, this is a bit technical, but this is the way to uh, deal with need-based aid and how to be uh, uh, savvy on how to complete these these forms, the CSS profile and the FAFSA form. Uh, the uh, the FAFSA is the free application uh, for uh, uh, for federal student aid, and all schools require this. Uh, and uh, it is an application that uh, for state schools, for private schools, it's it's from the federal government, the Department of Education. And uh, then you have the CSS profile, which is uh, an additional layer of information requested by the, uh, the, the more uh, selective uh, private colleges. So, and some public schools as well, but it's, it's a bit deeper than, than the FAFSA. Uh, and CSS goes college, uh, the scholarship services. Uh, and it's administered by the college board. And there are some differences between the FAFSA and the CSS profile in regards to uh, some of the assets that you share in the forum to uh, disclose your financial position. And uh, these assets, uh, they are there. Uh, there's like a, uh, a piece of information that is included in the CSS profile, but not included in the FAFSA. And I was wondering if uh, anybody has a guess on this. So what is included in the CSS profile, but not the FAFSA? The votes are coming in. You get we approach in that seventy percent mark. Yeah, these are two different forms. The CSS profile is a lot more detailed than the FAFSA. And great, this is a this is a nice spread. Yeah, so uh, maybe we should uh, share the results here. What is included in the CSS profile, but not in the FAFSA. So sharing the results, uh, the CSS profile does include home equity uh, on it. And uh, it's a bit surprising, but uh, yes, if you have paid your mortgage uh, faster, you actually have to report this and this is part of their consideration in giving you financial aid or not. Um, and um, so the FAFSA, again, so federal government, uh, uh, and uh, it's available in early October. Everybody does it, and uh, there'll be some big changes coming to the FAFSA this year. And uh, if parents are separated, the custodial parent is the one that uh, uh, appears there in a FAFSA form. So FAFSA, very important form. So being aware of how to fill it out correctly can give you some really uh, good extra dollars in need-based aid. Now the CSS profile, you can get a lot of uh, money from private schools. Based on the CSS profile, they, they have that difference between that $75,000 sticker price and the $25,000 uh, 
actual cost. And uh, again, available in early October, some um, uh, state schools don't require it, but some do. For example, University of Virginia, it requires that. It's more detailed and no custodial parent also is counted and many other things. And home equity is part of uh, the assets and the FAFSA and the, the CSS profile. I would urge you to, before doing anything college related, check out this website from the Department of Education. It's called the College Core Card. You can see the cost of college, many different parameters, a lot of valuable information with, uh, uh, that many colleges, both public and private, of all over the United States. It allows us to have better comparison and standardized data that the uh, parents and anybody contemplating college should check. And the cost of attendance is one of them. And it's kind of it's all over the place, but you can see the actual cost of attendance. Some of the colleges here, you may think that the most expensive ones have the cost of attendance that can be quite affordable because you know what? Some of these colleges, the fancy ones that have enormous endowments, they are very generous with their financial uh, aid. And uh, they differentiate a lot between different families it's not because you're making $150,000 a year or your household income is $200,000. You may still benefit from need-based aid from uh, some of these top colleges that have uh, enormous endowments that uh, they want to attract students. They, they can play uh, uh, in a way that uh, students and families can't afford. So check out College Scorecard. And finally, I have a book suggestion for you. It's a book that came out earlier this year, and it's an excellent book. There's a, a source of a lot of information, and it goes very deep in many aspects of uh, the college costs called The Price You Pay for College. It's by Ron Lieber, and he is a money columnist with the uh, New York Times. And um, I read this book. I was uh, really delighted to do that. It really uh, opened my eyes for certain things that I'm now sharing with you. and. Uh, uh, if you really want to have a clear idea of how to properly plan uh, the cost to pay for college or the price to pay for college, check out, read this book, get the audiobook, whatever is easier for you, but you can learn a lot uh, from uh, this. And uh, uh, with that, I would like to uh, close my presentation and uh, uh, take it back to uh, Rita and uh, uh, we probably have some uh, questions, but uh, Rita, uh, you can you can take over. Okay, I will do that. Marcio, thank you so much. That was great information. Remember, everyone, uh, um, you can put your questions in the question box, and we have saved some time. I have a few more things to go over with you, but we do have some time to answer your questions. So let me finish up here. Before we get to the Q&A, I wanted to share with you so you know that our free webinar next month is Gifting Children a Healthy Relationship with Money. And then in August, it's Military Families Transitioning to Civilian Life the costs and the challenges. So you might want to register for those on our website. I'd also like you all to know that we have a new ebook out. It's called Financial Social Work, Leaders in Financial Behavioral Health. You can download that from our website. Uh, I'd like to tell you that we do have a certification that includes 20 CEUs from National NASW, and we it is a self-study and self-paced program that our students have six months to complete. It includes all the materials plus, plus the final exam, uh, and the final exam, our students have two weeks to complete and submit it. There is a payment plan. Uh, we have thousands of graduates across the country and around the world. And we also, for our students and graduates, we have a professional financial social work network. Uh, we're on Facebook and LinkedIn, and we meet once a month in Zoom and do trainings and case studies and get to know each other and what everyone is doing with financial social work. 
remember, if you take nothing else away from my portion of this, and I hope you took a lot away from Marcio's, that clients overwhelmed by financial problems, stress, anxiety, and trauma, they didn't know how to prevent and have no idea how to fix are unable to learn, improve, or practice new money skills. And I share that with you because it's so foundational to my work and to all financial social work. So now we are ready for q and A. I'll remind you that keep your questions general if possible. The slides won't be shared because they are proprietary, but the recording will be up on the website before the weekend, I imagine, um, and on our YouTube channel and our um, financial social work Facebook pages. Uh, there are no CEs or certificates of attendance for this webinar. Just some really great content. So, Olga is here, and I didn't introduce Olga. She is all things tech, making sure that everything runs smoothly for us. Thank you, Olga. Do you have some questions for Marcio? Yes, we have questions. But first, uh, I want to say from Jennifer, thank you so much, especially for the book. Knowing the book and resources is very helpful. And question related to uh, resources um, also from uh, from Evel. Do you have specific websites that you find is a great source for scholarships? Marcio? Hello, here I am. I am now in uh, uh, live. Can, uh, can you see me, Rita, and uh, everyone? Yeah. There you are. Yes. Hi. All right. Hi. Thank you, Rita and uh, Olga and, and the team of uh, uh, the uh, Center for Financial Social Work. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. And uh, resources, yes, for scholarships and grants. There's in the presentation, we went over the there is a book that, that is, is a, a book about the guide of own scholarships. And uh, that is what I suggest. And it's called the Ultimate Scholarship Book, version 2021. This is the, the best source for it. And the uh, online resources connected to it as well. But that's what I, I suggest to get started is the book 2021 uh, for uh, scholarship. It's the Ultimate Scholarship Book. Now, uh, uh, what are the questions? Uh, uh, thank you. Next question. Uh, should I invest? I'm not sure. Is it a personal question or general? Just let mm -hmm. me know. Should I invest in 529 or is that counted against us when we are trying to get grants and scholarships? Fantastic question. Uh, I cannot answer specifically if you should invest or not. It really depends on many factors. But what I can tell for sure is that both in the FAFSA and the CSS profile, it is included, it appears there, and it will uh, decrease a bit your ability to get need-based aid. So having your assets in other places that will not be counted can be a good from that perspective. Having said that, there are some tax benefits and investment benefits to doing a 529 plan that could be balanced, and there are some, some positives, some negatives, and uh, the, the specific answer depends on each uh, situation, each family situation. But uh, it is indeed counted as an asset, and it can reduce a bit the, the financial aid. Marcio, doesn't it also depend on what state you live in, whether um, it's taxed or not? That's about the extent of my knowledge when it comes to yeah yeah uh, the the five twenty nines are state uh, sponsored plans and very often uh, it can be quite of an advantage. Uh, let's say my state of Virginia is a very generous one. What you contribute to the five twenty nine along the way 
could have uh, a uh, tax benefit now on the state income tax is a state income tax deduction some states they they do have state income tax but they don't have much generous uh, uh, deductions for 529 so it doesn't make much sense depending on your state and some states like Florida or Texas when you don't have state income tax that benefits not present because there's not even a state income tax to to uh, uh, aim to reduce so again it really depends where you live in terms of the states depends on your family circumstances it depends on uh, all the assets you have outside or the income uh, it can be uh, an area that uh, uh, it may be a, a, an advantage to have a plan like this or sometimes a disadvantage and the money could be uh, coming from other sources. It really depends, but uh, it is counted in, as an asset and it can reduce a bit the, uh, the uh, need-based eligibility uh, and uh, it does have some state level tax benefits. And there are some federal level tax benefits as well. Uh, it's, we will have to have a whole new webinar presentation to go into the weeds of 529s and how they work. But uh, the answer is, is, is depend. You need to, it depends. You need to understand your specific circumstances to make a decision. Yeah. Wow, thanks to the questioner because I learned a lot about that. Um, and that's pretty interesting to me. Thanks, Marcio. Olga, more questions? Yes. Um, next question. My understanding is that in case of divorce, if the custodial parent remarries, uh, the new spouse income is also included in the CSS profile, a significant deter, uh, deterrent to remarrying if you have children near or of college age. Wow. <laughs> and the answer no is question. <laughs> the, the, the way the, 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 the system is set up is the system that kind of discourages marriage. And uh, uh, if you're in a situation that you could potentially delay marrying somebody, uh, or if you're in a situation that you would maybe could accelerate divorce, that could be uh, a, uh, a strategy. So yeah, uh, that's the reality. And sometimes these rules, they are anti-family, anti-marriage, but uh, I would say so. Yeah, uh, the postponing marriage, maybe, uh, accelerating the divorce could be helpful for financial aid purposes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. I have a daughter who just graduated with her undergraduate degree and is now applying for medical schools. I was surprised to see that they also compute an estimated family contribution, including parental income. Uh, do you have any recommendation for how to deal with this level of debt or books to read? This is one of the most challenging things, graduate school, and uh, how costly it is. Uh, the, some of the, the strategies there are, are still present, meaning even like the, the military, can, there can be some opportunities. Uh, the, some schools, they, they offer some special deals. I, if I'm not mistaken, NYU has a great medical program with, uh, I don't think they, they, they charge a uh, tuition even, <laughs> and uh, good luck living in New York City, but uh, they have uh, so much in terms of their endowment that they can support a medical program uh, that doesn't cost that much. But uh, researching uh, the programs and uh, uh, also considering a local one that you could commute and don't pay the, the room and board fees. Uh, and uh, some of the, the institutions and in, in, uh, the uh, uh, like the military, for example, but some others that would promote people obtaining that uh, level of education, of medical education. But it's quite tricky, and most people end up not finding much. And colleges uh, that provide that level, the medical schools, what is the, the case is that uh, many, many people graduate with significant debt loads, and it's kind of hard to escape that. Uh, and uh, but the good news is that uh, you can also have very, very high salaries after completing medical school and your residency. So uh, what I would uh, also keep in mind is that there can be some interesting student loan management strategies once you graduate and be, uh, uh, when you're a resident. So you complete school and you're resident. The years you're in residency, you can uh, optimize the management of your student loans. And um, uh, this is something we do for our young doctors 
and uh, think about that. There can be some some clever ways to manage that. But uh, uh, yeah, medical school is very challenging. I think you said at the very beginning, uh, do your research, do your research, do your research. And every one Absolutely. of these questions is do your research. Yeah, yeah. And NYU Medical School may be a good solution. And if you have family in New York City, there you go. You can make, make things work in a, in a good way. So, Any more, Olga? Yes, um, we have a few more questions. We are now facing a shortage of young people entering the trades. Are there also resources for students going to trade schools or community colleges that offer certification in the trades? Uh, I am not fully aware of this, uh, of specifics on, on getting certifications on the trades. But community college can be a really good and inexpensive way of uh, obtaining uh, trade-related uh, training. And I know here right next to our office, Montgomery College, they do offer a lot of uh, scholarships uh, for uh, community uh, college. So uh, that will be the first place, your local community college, where you live and what is available there. Uh, also, again, the military. It's a, maybe it's a great way to obtain trade-related education. Uh, I have done some work with the military in the past, and you can learn how to be uh, a mechanic. You can learn how to be. Uh, it can be in construction trade and, and uh, electricity trade, uh, electronics. So um, that may be a great way to uh, obtain a trade-related education is via the military. But Marcio, you didn't mention. I just realized this. Um, if a student goes to community college for two years, then they're automatically, and they do well, they're automatically accepted into a state school, right? Absolutely, good. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And it happens right here in our backyard with uh, Montgomery College and the uh, University of Maryland. They have an agreement. It has to be like an agreement between your local state school and uh, your local community college. But in our case here, there is an agreement that can be a great way to take care of the courses, the general courses, and, uh, and a very inexpensive way. And then when the specialized courses that account specifically to a major, you can close in, uh, in with the state school. So that's the fantastic way to pay much less is you start with community college and then you do the transfer to your local state school. And there are some agreements in place where credits are counted and it's very well uh, oiled and uh, fine tuned. So um, think about that because that's a great, great way to also manage this. It's a subset of going to your local college. So uh, going to your local college, go to the com community college and then the local state school, and uh, that can be fantastic way to, to deal with, uh, with the cost and uh, for the beginning of, uh, of the education. And if you live with your parents, there you go. You can, you can save a lot and go to the whole college pro uh, program at a fraction of the cost. Okay, thank you. Rita, do we have uh, time for three more questions? But I guess if you make them quick and he answers them quickly and he has the time, we'll go for it. Okay. Uh, I can do my, it. Then I'll, I'll answer quickly. Yeah. If my child is independent, I don't claim them on my income tax, nor does her other parent. Will FAFSA still require our income? If the child is independent, it's the child's income. Yeah. Um, so it's not the parent, it will be the child, but it has to be a, an independent, independent child. Yeah. It's parents don't, don't count in that case. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what are the most important ch uh, chances coming to the FAFSA this year? FAFSA this year has a big change. And the most important one is that if you have more than one child going to college at the same time, there's no longer going to be a break. So um, families that have uh, kids going to college together, they will not get a discount and it will be more challenging for those families. So that's the most important uh, change in the FAFSA this year. Also, uh, and, and that has to do with the expected family contribution. They're gonna change the name. It's not gonna be expected uh, family contribution. It's gonna be the, the uh, student aid index, SAI. Okay, thank you. And the last question, what is the most common mistake people make when completing the FAFSA? 
oh, this can be a little bit scary. But when you complete the FAFSA, pay attention. If you have a 401k rollover into an IRA, if you don't complete it correctly, sometimes this 401k rollover that can be counted as income. And that, if that's the case, you'll bump your income significantly, will be a big headache, and you'll have to be appealing each school and showing, oh, my income was not that. It was indeed a 401k rollover. So there's a specific way of filling the FAFSA in that case to avoid for the counting of a rollover as income. So uh, pay attention to this. When you transfer from your employer plan or uh, a 401k into an IRA, you do a rollover, you got to be careful for it not to be counted as income for in the FAFSA form. Marcia, you were great. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience learned a lot. I'm not going to say all of it was what I wanted to hear or know about college for grandchildren and children, but how wonderful of you to share your expertise with us. Thank you so much, and I'm going to see if we can't get you back again in the future. Wonderful. I would love to go back, to come back. Yeah, thank you very much, Rita. Thank you, Olga. Thank you for the audience. Thank you for taking your time to be part of this webinar. It was a pleasure. And uh, I love to talk about this subject. This is a very dear subject to me. And, uh, well, I wish you all the best in uh, your college uh, funding and uh, college uh, uh, pursuits. So uh, all the best. Take care. Thanks, Marcel. Stay well. Thank you.